What's the power of a college degree? We've put so much value on it over the past half a century. College grads use it to express their credibility. Employers see it as a rite of passage that signals skill and accomplishment. Yet today, recent graduates in America face record high unemployment. They carry a trillion dollars in debt. That degree no longer guarantees middle class success. And employers question whether they're getting the quality they need. Suddenly, there are new ways to learn, from free online courses to immersive classroom technology to startups that teach you just the skills you need. How do we need to learn in this new age? What are we willing to pay for? And what are the essential skills of a 21st century workforce, especially here in the Pacific Northwest? We'll explore these questions and more with four creative leaders who are hacking EDU. I'm Hanson Hossein. Welcome to Four Peaks, live from Husky Fest at the University of Washington. What if your tuition was $6,000 a year? You could take as many courses as you like. You weren't required to take the SATs to get admitted. You don't have a GPA when you graduate. And you never have to sit in a classroom. That's the model for the online-only Western Governors University. Jean Floten has been chancellor of its Washington branch this last year. Before that, she served as the president of Bellevue College for two decades. Jean, welcome. Thank you very much. Well, you brought a lot of innovation to Bellevue College. Why did you think that you had to go for this next challenge for higher education and move to Western Governors? Great question, Hanson. Um, I think this is a renaissance in higher education. I am, I am just amazed every day when you listen to some of the innovations that are happening right now. Uh, as you said, open content, uh, courses offered for free, information is everywhere. And I think that it's causing us to reimagine ourselves as educators. What does it really mean to be an educator in the 21st century? And I, you know, I'm reminded of Tom Peters' book when he talked about trains kind of losing market share because they saw themselves being in the train business rather than in the transportation business. And I think in higher education, we're concerned about student learning, but our real role is giving credibility to what they know and can do. So what explains the shift then? If that's the case, and maybe it's been the case for a while now, why all of a sudden do we have these new models like Western Governors University being so successful? Well, I think there are a number of things that go into that. Um, one, you know, you mentioned several items in the prelude to the show. Um, costs are accelerating, tuition now is increasing by double digits sometimes every year. Um, students are obtaining huge debt burdens and people are looking at different ways of delivering high quality, higher education at a lower cost. And I think that we're just beginning to see the transformational uses of the internet that can deliver education anywhere, anytime, any place. And it's opened up a whole new world to adult learners that have been place-bound with families, kids, dogs, mortgages, um, you know, who couldn't go back to school to complete that degree. Now they can. They can go to the soccer game, cheer their daughter on, and uh, sign into a course and do a little bit of it, and they can do it on their time at their pace. So I think it's really liberated us. I can see the value there, but you know, I look at what we do, what we do so well. We don't offer any of our courses in the program that I help run online. And some people would say, well, this can only really be accomplished face to face with a professor who can show you the way. How can you assure quality and accountability when you don't actually even see your students? I think that's another great question. While WGU uses the internet, it also has a very high touch model. Uh, when a student signs on to us, they're assigned a concierge mentor that sticks with them through their whole education. Uh, this person sets the pace of what they're doing, helps them keep on track, helps them resolve problems. 
And when they enter into coursework, um, into courses, they have a subject matter expert that spends one-on-one -on -one time with them um, rather than being in a, a classroom with often hundreds of students. Uh, this person is by their side, uh, be it virtually, uh, by instant messaging or Adobe Connect or some other tool that allows them to conference with the student. So no issues of plagiarism or cheating then when it comes to assessment? Do you know, I was just amazed to find out the high fidelity monitoring services that are available now. We assign students a camera, it goes on their computer, it has a fisheye lens, you can see 180 degrees in their homes. I have to laugh because many women clean their houses before they turn the camera on, which I thought was amazing. Um, but it watches the students and it, it has done this so long that they can tell by eye movements, hand movements, anything irregular, and it's just shut off until they check the student's room. So I think that we can uh, demonstrate very um, concretely that it is our student that's doing that assignment in real time. So how do employers perceive a degree from Western Governors University? You don't necessarily have that same kind of transcript. You don't have necessarily um, of grades even, or grade point average. Is it seen as a credible accreditation for a student? Well, as you know, we're competency-based. And that means that a student has to demonstrate what they know and can do. And they have to do that before they can proceed. So you can't just get a C in a class uh, where you don't have to know everything. With our degree, you have to demonstrate competency for each of the things that we've identified that you need to know. And um, we actually, we did a Harris Interactive poll this year with the employers of our WGU students. And an amazing 100% said that they were satisfied with our students and would hire another. Um, our students are very interesting because they're working adults. Um, they often have a lot of life experience. And so, it's, so working adults, so should somebody who's 18 years old come to Western Governors University, can they be admitted? They, they can be admitted, but we really recruit graduates. And we have learned that a student needs to have some college and some online experience to be successful. So we'll advise that student to go to their local community college first and to get that experience under their belt, and then we welcome them. And briefly, what can we in traditional higher education take away from what has gone on at Western Governors? To me, as a bricks and mortar educator for years, the liberating concept was to break the iron triangle of credits, seat time, and funding. Um, that to me is the last frontier, because you don't have to sit in a seat. If you can demonstrate what you know and you can do, you can proceed at your own pace. And I think that's a powerful, powerful concept. Well, that's great. Well, when we come back, our next guest inspired video gamers to solve a complex scientific challenge. That's how he ended up with 57,000 co-authors on his academic publication. The digital revolution has turned communications upside down. It poses challenges and opportunities to professionals seeking to influence and persuade. These are our students in the Master of Communication and Digital Media program, innovators who think entrepreneurially about how to engage communities through storytelling. As creative leaders, together we're charting the future of communication. Want to join us? Find out more at mcdm.uw.edu. You no longer need a PhD to make an incredible scientific breakthrough. At least that's what the Huffington Post declared when describing an online game site where users could decode complex proteins for fun. In 10 days, these gamers solved a 15-year-old AIDS problem. Few of them knew anything about, about, about biochemistry. The Tetris-like game is called Fold It, and despite that catchy headline, a faculty member with a PhD at the University of Washington created it. Zoran Popovich is the director of the Center for Game Science at the University of Washington. Zoran, you brought an innovative approach to your research as an academic. What else do you think we should be doing to, to take that ethic, that, that, that philosophy, to transform higher education? 
Uh, well, I think uh, the, the, one of the most important things is to think about how to incentivize the whole idea of education. So, uh, you know, when we are born, we first learn because we're just curious uh, and we want to discover things. Somewhere along the way, some of that stuff gets lost. And so some of the things that I've been trying to do is think about the incentive structure as an instrumental part of the education. And specifically, how can we use uh, uh, incentive structure or ways to make things fun such that we can have people that didn't even know that had fantastic skills of scientific discovery uh, to actually push this, the, the, the scientific discoveries into whole new directions uh, as a result of simply uh, playing something that they really enjoy. Does that mean your classes are all fun and games then? Uh, I don't know if my classes are, but I certainly think that the, the games that we produce uh, are. Because you've, you've actually gone as far as saying it's not homework, it's home play. Yeah, so that's, that's one of the models that we're working on is basically how can you uh, have the assessment or practice be not just embedded into these really boring tasks, but actually something that has a purpose and that you didn't even notice you were doing just because you actually wanted to do it. And so, and so when it comes to uh, incentivizing students, is it just here at the university that you're working on that? Uh, no, actually, I mean, the, uh, the, the folded game was, is played by people all over the world, about 500,000 people. Uh, the, the educational games for early math are now played in many school districts around the country and internationally. Let's take a quick look at that video to explain what uh, your games in math and science have been about. Refraction is a game that provides over four hours of material for conceptual understanding of fractions. It has won two prestigious international awards in the last two years. It's about cute creatures stranded in space. If you can provide the right fraction of laser fuel to each spaceship, the cute creatures will be rescued. You may need to split the lasers several times or recombine them in creative ways. The game gives a great amount of control to the teacher. For example, a teacher can create home plays, as opposed to homework, by simply typing in several fractional expressions and posting a message. While students are playing, the teacher portal shows key concepts, depicted here as example expressions, for all students in a mastery matrix. The portal can also automatically point to key findings, like students that have full mastery of concepts or concepts that seem to be uniformly problematic to most students. No grading necessary. The teacher can click on the concept and see a list of example challenges that could serve as good anchors for class discussion. The teacher can zoom into each box to see the number of times each student is exposed to each concept, and even look deeper into the exact playback of that level that shows the mathematical reasoning progression. So that's quite amazing, uh, getting kids to really engage in tough subjects like science and math. Now, grumpy people like me would say, well, what happened to, why, why shouldn't, why do we have to have kids play games to do this? Shouldn't they be engaged in this material regardless? Uh, yeah, I mean, the question is, yeah, ultimately they will. In fact, that's the whole objective of a lot of things that we're doing is that they should, they can, initially they can have badges, or all these sort of short-term incentives, but really ultimately they should think, huh, math is actually cool, or I self-identify with mathematics, and I think, that uh, I want to pursue that because it's something that's interesting to me. And that's actually the ultimate incentive that once you get students to that place, it actually doesn't matter, you're done. Because all the stuff happens naturally afterwards. So how successful has this been so far? Uh, it, this particular thing is in early trials. I can tell you that a huge number of school districts are really excited about actually trying this because fractions is one of the biggest bottlenecks in early math education. and. What we're basically saying is that over a period of time, we could potentially eradicate this as a big issue simply through uh, allowing every child to play multiple uh, games like this and just realizing these misconceptions can be just completely removed. Speaking of games, you've done remarkable things with your Foldit uh, gaming platform. What was the concept behind that as a tool for research? Yeah, so the idea uh, there was that there was, there's this big problem about figuring out how proteins fold. It turns out proteins are the secret to life. They do everything in nature. And then the question is, if, if anybody who knew how every protein was folded, they would know how to regenerate tissue, how to attack any disease, etc. This problem is very important, but all the computers in the world and all the scientists in the world cannot currently predict accurately these structures. So what we did is said, OK, let's take this problem that maybe there are uh, 1,000 scientists in the world working on today, and let's expose it to hundreds of thousands of people and see if we can actually break <coughs> new ground in scientific research. That's amazing. Do we have that video that we can show? 
Welcome to Fold It. Here we are in competition puzzle 50, strep binding. This protein is from a bacteria that causes strep throat. I'm Kathleen and it looks like I'm currently rank 84, which means I have a long way to go to get to the top. I'm competing against all these other players to fold this protein the best and get the highest score I possibly can. Now let's take a look at the protein. Note that I can rotate, translate, and zoom the camera. This thick strand that bends all around is called the backbone. Notice it's made up of helices, which are these curly spirals, and these flat sheets. When the flat sheets get close, they form hydrogen bonds. I'll talk more about hydrogen bonds later. These dangly things coming off of the backbone are called side chains. They can move into a discrete number of positions based on their molecular structure, so don't be surprised when they don't move exactly where you want them to. Now let's take a look at our tools. We were just talking about side chains, so let's look at this shake side chains tool. What it does is fixes all of the side chains at once, basically finds a good configuration for all of them such that these clashes are resolved. The main tool that we use is called the pull tool. This works by clicking and dragging on the backbone or on the side chains. So there's a larger implication here that people can engage in complicated science without actually having a background in it. What does that mean? Yeah, in fact, the, the top 20 players in our game have had uh, one chemistry class in college or less. Some obviously didn't even have that. And what's, once we realized that, we, we knew that we were onto something really, really exciting. Because these are not, uh, you know, so obviously we didn't just uh, have a whole bunch of biochemists play this game. In fact, the biochemists early on started quitting the game en masse because they realized that regular people were beating the crap out of them over the, uh, <laughs> at this game. And that, that was actually exciting because now you see this siloed uh, community that is very good. They spend their lifetime on this. And now we have expanded this by maybe a factor of four or five, which is why we were able to create uh, three or four new discoveries published in Nature. Well, we'll take this, this, this matter of science and math up a little further in our next segment. Our next guest will explain the huge discrepancy between our region's innovation economy and the lack of qualified graduates to drive it. We'll be right back. The state of Washington ranks second in the country for innovation and entrepreneurship. Sounds great, right? But it's near the bottom at 46 for participation in science and engineering graduate programs. Our inability to provide a workforce to meet our economic needs has inspired regional leaders to promote education in STEM. That's short for science, technology, engineering, and math. Ruby Love has been at the forefront of this nexus between industry and education for decades. Ruby, you're now the Chief Development Officer for Washington STEM. What explains this incredible discrepancy between what we're doing as an economic engine and what we're providing to drive that engine from a student point of view? Well, I think we've spent actually decades ignoring a pipeline that essentially has uh, hundreds of leaks in it. And those leaks actually begin at uh, the early learning stage where children, when children are born and what is taught uh, in terms of preschool settings and in-home settings. And then it proceeds on right straight through um, high school. And so when a student seeks to come to an institution like this, many situations they're unprepared to go into um, the persistent and persisting classes uh, that would um, have them come out on the other end fluent in STEM careers. So what's industry here in the Pacific Northwest largely looking for from that point of view? Well, they, they're looking for uh, a ready workforce, uh, people who are proficient in science, proficient in, in technology and engineering and math, and they're looking for people who don't necessarily always have to have those degrees, but they have to have the knowledge and the background that you and I take for granted in how we work every day uh, in terms of doing the work that we're doing. So just putting this program on today, think about the technology that's behind all that's operating to make us look good on this stage. And you look great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But, but really, um, there's, there are um, something like 70% of all of the jobs in North America require a level of fluency in STEM that is today. 
And then when we get to like the year 2018, there will be a million jobs that just have STEM career titles that will need to be filled. And our pipeline is not producing that at all. So how do we address this? How do we fill the pipeline? Well, I think a couple of things. The, the prior speaker, we have to remove the stigma that is attached to STEM fields and, and uh, STEM literacy. So right now, it is, it's viewed as um, an elitist area. Uh, there's a title that's called Geek uh, that goes with it. And what we want to do is we want to actually flatten that so that um, young people as well as people of all ages see that there's a possibility for them to achieve and succeed um, in those fields and in those areas. And that I think also that industry and business um, has to play a role with education as opposed to in prior years, I think there's been a lot of finger pointing. And that some of that finger pointing goes to maybe the kind of funding that we get for the K-12 to education system or even for higher education that if we're not providing a sufficient tax base to provide that STEM education, then we can't get the employees that we need. So when industry is looking to create this pool of graduates, do they also say, oh, we need to actually pony up more money to fund it as well? I think it's, I think it's not only ponying up money. So what we're finding out is that the other thing that really helps students is experience. And so th what I, I love about uh, the folded piece that was just on is that these are people that did not have necessarily STEM backgrounds, but they are actually practicing math. They're practicing physics in the technology that they use to solve a problem. Students need that same kind of experience. Schools and teachers need the money behind the work so that they're able to have the instructional materials, they're able to transport kids to um, experiences like that, but it's, not, it's more than money. Um, given that it's more, money, more than money, we still need the resources to provide that kind of curriculum. We're seeing a lot of these courses online for, for free. Now, MIT has open course where Stanford University offered a course in robotics that had 160,000 people sign up for, and it was for free. Does that provide some kind of solution to sort of filling that pipeline as well? I think there's many solutions. I, I want, and I think you want, your children to have a menu of opportunities to choose from. I do feel that there are still going to be students that need a campus life. They need to come, they need to live on campus, they need to have, you know, uh, be exposed in a classroom setting where they can have open discussion and teachers act as coaches. I think that some students are able to learn in an online setting and they check in with, uh, I, I heard the word connoisseur mentors, I think that's an excellent um, strategy. And then I think there are other students that want to be in the field and all of their learning is field learning. So, I, I, you know, the big thing in STEM is not saying that there's a single lane that people go down to become successful. We have to be willing to fund and to um, innovate in many different ways. When we look at the capacity of higher education as an infrastructure here in this region, in terms of what industry wants, is it sufficient? When we hear about a university from Massachusetts, like Northeastern, coming here to set up a campus so they can educate more engineers, what does that say about us? What else do we need to be doing to provide that kind of infrastructure? What I think it says a couple of things. I think it says that there are inequities in terms of who's admitted. There are inequities in terms of who is supported to, retain, to be retained in uh, college or in higher education. And there are inequities in terms of the diversity of degrees and programs that are offered. And so that allows for a Northeastern to come here, and it allows actually for a University of Washington to go someplace else. So, so I, I think that we have to get over our turf war situations. I think we have to understand that the inequities will continue if we do not open our thinking and our ways. There are, uh, there, the statistics say that 78% of young people in the country are people of color and indigenous populations, 78% today in high school. So what does that mean for who's going to be admitted into our various institutions? It means that we're gonna to have to change how we operate and how we um, do our admissions and who we view as our ideal student.
And so there is an equality issue. There's a cost issue, obviously, for admitting those kinds of students. President Obama mentioned something like that at the State of the Union address, where he basically said that universities have to address their costs. You look at universities like the University of Washington, they're, they're as lean as they can be. And when state funding is also going down, they, they have no choice but to put up tuition. So how do we deal with that accessibility issue when we, can't, we don't have much wiggle room when it comes to tuition? Well, I think we, t we talked about a couple of examples. So we talked about accessibility coming through free on free classroom settings um, through professors who um, are world renowned and their, their uh, presentations are, are shown publicly and, ha and there's great access that way. I think also um, that community and technical colleges have play a role. And many times the, the, the four year and six year and eight year degree will no longer be needed. There is a shorter, there can be a shorter learning curve and also, and this is a whole nother presentation, but the styles of learning that our brains are able to function under have not been explored at all. And I think that that is yet another area that we can um, show proficiency for STEM. Well, that's a great way to look towards the future. So when we return from STEM to STEAM, how we need to write in an A for art in any reimagination of the classroom. Leonardo da Vinci was an engineer, a scientist, and a painter. His timeless creations prove that experimentation and exploration are common to both art and science. That's why even as we push for left brain STEM graduates, we shouldn't forget that crucial creative half. As author Daniel Pink declared, the MFA is the new MBA. Mark Gonzalez doesn't have a master of fine art. Still, his renowned poetry and a master's in education have inspired his drive for imagination and invention in the classroom. Mark, you were a visiting scholar at Stanford, the heart of Silicon Valley, very tech-oriented. If you were to teach a class in engineering with your thoughts about creativity and innovation, how would you go about that? I think at the core of any question around the arts, you have to begin with what is the function and the purpose of arts. And at the core of it, we have to remind ourselves that art and artists are the educators of imagination. Often when we per conceptualize of anything in the aesthetic field, we think of it only in a consumption manner. There's a stage, we watch it. There's a movie, we watch it. There's a song, we listen to it. It's only one directional. And in, we don't necessarily think about the process of creativity itself, that engineers need to be creative to actually address the issues that we're facing as a humanity and as a species in these days and times. So architects have to be creative both with their resources, educators have to be creative with their budgets as well as their curriculum. What we're really dealing with in this time is how do we be more innovative? And you cannot address innovation unless you're actually addressing imagination. So how would you bring imagination? There seems to be such a stigma right now against the liberal arts, about, against studying poetry that we have to focus on science technology and engineering how do you say you know what you got to learn this stuff too so I think the way most people would try to frame it would be to bring the question into how the arts can benefit science and I think it needs to go in reverse and ask how can science benefit the arts and how are the arts necessary for the future of humanity if we look at it inside the United States, and we think specifically we speak predominantly a variety of many languages, most people speak a Latin-based language, whether it's English or Spanish. If you look at poetry, the core root of the word poetry means to make things, you know, at least in Latin. If you look at the core root of poetry in Arabic, it literally means to speak emotions. So when we get into the artistic field, we're actually talking about emotional intelligence. And what is the role of emotional intelligence in education? In the United States, 36,000 people a year commit suicide. Over one million attempt. If we even look at just the successful suicides, the enrollment at the University of Washington for undergraduates is 27,000. If you took the suicide successes in the United States, and put it inside the University of Washington campus, 
you'd be at a deficit of 9,000 students per year that you're putting into the grave at an early age. And so we have to ask ourselves, when that type of emotional reality is what we as a humanity are facing in these days and times, how do we begin to unpack and explore that? And how can we unpack and explore that if we're not in conversation and dialogue with our internal emotions as well as our interpersonal emotions? So we've asked you to think about this, converse, this topic and this conversation. And if you were to create something, some kind of poetry, we asked you to do a little performance for us to sort of get our emotions and imagination going. Do you have something that you could share with us right now? I would love to. Okay, Mark, there's your mark. In any conversation, we always begin with respect to First Nations and to the indigenous, in Seattle, the Duwamish, and with love. Dear Columbus, you cannot discover a land 70 million people are living on. Never understood the term Indian giver. Our original people only gave life to pilgrims two centuries before the Bill of Rights, only asking for our right to breath. Instead, they read us our right to death rights and white rights to land, which landed us right in the middle of reservations, and they wonder why our hope is reserved. It's a force of habit when those with habits hosted masses are labeled us half savage, half heathen, to the point where centuries later, we are still believing that we are not beautiful, but no more. Therefore, let it be known that I am a Mesoamerican Mexican, born in 1975 to be part of the hip-hop generation, predestined to be malnourished in the 80s when President Reagan thought ketchup was a vegetable. Just so he wouldn't have to buy my brother's school lunch program, Green Beans, we learned to survive off of music, stood in line for CDs like it was government cheese, and instead of black beans and collard greens, we ate MCs for lunch. As such, our resistance to death had us labeled revolutionary, like public enemy number one, one of those children of the sun. Our Native American drum is the root of this history called hip hop, root is in pre, before our rhyme mind is in line with the divine design. We survived a vanilla ice age, got crucified in death row records, only to be reborn in a Jurassic five age. Those who have you believe that we, like Chuck D, are what's wrong with the world today. Those who will not sit down, shut up, and conform, but we were not born to conform. We were born to grow, create, rebel, grow, create, rebel. We were born in hell and died twice for surviving. The hood is proof, the afterlife, life after death, life called breath. We are beyond Christ. We don't break bread. We break dance and break beats to feed the masses. Masses meaning people like the Black Panthers for the people, like the word Mexica of the people, like most deaf. My people, I am Mark Gonzalez representing our people, our people our people without hesitance. The question is, at the end of your life, who will you represent? And let me be clear, to the eyes of I and I cry from Mau Mau to Mumbai, I grind for the ghetto in Gaza. Dear world, the sexiest party of the human body is its spine. I really would like to see it more often. Mark, thank you. So are we at heart a creative culture here in the United States? I think we have to really address again, in this time, we need more questions, less answers, um, and finding that we need to be engaged in a collective process. So when you ask me, are we a creative culture, I actually wonder what our culture is, because politics has a culture. There's a culture of violence, there's a culture of silence. We also have a culture of love and compassion. And all these are both intersecting as well as in conflict with one another. And so we do have a creative culture. We also have a lot of cultures that are ending up with too many people in coffins at a too early age. The question is which culture is going to win out? And how do we, in this economy, and when we talk about economies, I keep on hearing people talking about we have to get jobs. We have to talk about the future of funds. When we don't even know what the economy of dollars and capital is going to look like in one year, 
How do we begin to address economies of emotions? All right, well, I think we'll leave it there. We'll come back to that when we have our questions from the audience. We'll be right back with all four of our creative leaders with questions from our attendees. back with our Four Peaks Hacking EDU thought leaders, Mark Gonzalez, Ruby Love, Zoran Popovich, and Gene Floten. First question, is there really a crisis in higher education? We've seen a proliferation of books in the last year, lots of articles. Even the Chronicle of Higher Education was saying, is higher education doomed to be the next Borders bookstore? Sort of, we're facing this obsolescence. Do you believe that there is this crisis, and what is that crisis? Anybody want to take that first? Jean, go ahead. I believe there is. I, I really lament at how much indebtedness our students have now, um, often with no real means to pay back the debt on their student loans. I also lament at how much an education cost. Um, and when we have all these amazing tools that are available that could help to educate people, um, and knowledge or at least information is everywhere. I, I really think that, you know, as I said, I think the time is right to rethink many of our premises about higher education um, to have more of our students be successful. Would anybody else like to address that? Uh, Zoran and then Mark? I, I guess I, I would say that it's maybe an opportunity rather than a crisis in the sense that um, you can uh, Obviously, the answer is not just let's just ditch all the universities and let's have a completely different model, but more of a blended one with the, where you can, we can find a sweet spot of what is best at, at the uni university setting and what are the other ways in which uh, different means of education can supplement and make uh, everything together much bigger than the, what it currently is. I would actually say that what we're facing is not a crisis in education, it's what's, we're finally acknowledging how education has created a crisis in our communities. For centuries, according to your identity, if you were African in the US, it was illegal to teach you to read and write, like punishable by death. For indigenous people, you were forced into school and taught a different language that separated you from your ability to communicate with your people. As education became associated with an industrial revolution and your ability to actually get employment, not everybody was granted access to that. And so we're in a place now where we're actually asking, what does education supposed to provide for the people it's located in? So whether that's a crisis or not, people can decide what word they want to use. But everybody is now starting to face the same reality that some of us have been facing for centuries. And Ruby, that gets to your point about accessibility in solving the STEM issue as well, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, you know, I think it's, I think uh, Mark put, brings forth a good um, point, and that is for some it's been a crisis, and I think for others it is seen as an opportunity that we can act upon. I think, again, I have to go to the fact that we have so many options mm -hmm. and we have to get out of this mindset that it's my way or the highway. And unfortunately, higher education has been organized around my way or the highway. And so a lot of people are out on the highway wandering aimlessly and they are needed in the economies of North America. It's not, it's not even just the US. They're needed in the economies that run this entire continent. And we have got to get it together and understand that you can't be exclusionary. You've got to be inclusive in order to keep the economies of the entire North American continent going forward. Well, let's go to our attendees and see what their thoughts are about this. Do you have a question for us? Yeah, so as someone who has two degrees from the University of Washington and has actually worked here on campus uh, for a few years in the past, I truly believe in the mission of the university and higher education uh, across the board. But I also have a background in newspapers and I know the importance of communication. And I think a lot of the times that these 
uh, discussions about how to fix higher ed happen in a silo. So first of all, from all of us here, thank you for, for coming today. I think this is fantastic. But how do we break out of that silo? How do we build a groundswell in the community to get the public uh, not just aware of what's happening, but engaged in the discussion about how to fix higher education? Because we all know that at the public level, that's where we're really going to start to see some momentum build. So this is about in public engagement and having that conversation with them rather than just insular, maybe here just at university. Maybe you want to tackle that? Well, I, you know, so I think that things like this require movement and they require movement from a lot of different directions. And so, you know, when I talked earlier about um, business pointing its finger at education and education looking to business to supply all the dollars, uh, I think that you know when you talk about a movement, it is something that it happens as a groundswell, but it usually is something that is forced. So what has happened within the automobile industry was a forced situation. And there was planning that this was going to have to occur, but when it came down to it, it was an economic force situation. We're actually in that vortex right now. And being prepared with what kinds of opportunities can in fact then unfold, I think is a key. And I know with Washington STEM, the way that we are approaching it, it's kind of threefold. So we're saying that we know that there are innovative teachers and, and learners out there who are willing to take risks on things that are not necessarily proven. We also know that there are um, people who are practicing things that are we know work at, with all students regardless of how they learn. And then we also know that there are clusters in communities or geographic areas that actually want to invest in their own futures. And so, you know, our, our feeling is, is you've got to do both ends. You've got to go with what you know works, and you've got to take risks on things that don't, you don't necessarily know work. Those are the things that actually initiate movements. And, uh, I, I, you know, that's, that's the way I, that was my experience in the 60s um, in terms of civil rights, and I know that it has moved us forward as a country, but we've got to do much better than that. And Zoran, when I think of what's so remarkable about your work is that you've engaged the public and the community in your research in a, in a very non-specialized way. What kind of reaction have you received from those thousands of people who've played your games? Has it been an aha moment that, oh, I can engage with higher education. I can engage in really specific, difficult research and actually make a difference. Definitely. I mean, you, you, we hear these stories all the time about, uh, you know, from grandmothers with high school education who never heard about uh, proteins before and now they're just uh, there every day helping anybody who knew who comes into the game with sort of continuing on, on, on to actually do the challenges to uh, kids that decided to go into biochemistry in college because they, they found out of a folded to salesmen in Texas who discovered who were the first authors on Nature Paper because they discovered a new protein that nobody else uh, had before. And similarly, what you realize is that it's not individuals, but actually this collective intelligence that emerges when you actually group a lot of people with a fairly nimble infrastructure with which they can ideate and create the ideas together. And so this is actually something that I'm working on towards what if we can put all the creative teachers together such that they can very quickly brainstorm and describe to everyone else exactly what works in their classroom, which can then be deployed everywhere else and evaluated exactly for the best and most effective variations. Collective intelligence and a nimble infrastructure, it sounds like a great new model for higher education. So thanks for putting it that way. We have another question. Hi, yes, I have a sort of seemingly simple but maybe more complex question, which is, where do you think the new ideas are gonna come from? Where, where are the new ideas for higher education? Where are these new concepts coming from? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, Jean, you've been dealing with new ideas for the last year as chancellor for Washington State for Western Governors University. Where are those new ideas coming from? You know, I have to give a lot of credit to um, places like the Gates Foundation, the Lumina Foundation. I think the role of uh, large foundations that reach out and uh, recognize creativity and innovation it is one of the places where that's going to come from. I think organizations like the National Science Foundation, you know, you start looking at funders that are willing to take a chance on a new idea. And uh, part of the responsibility of receiving monies like that often is dissemination. 
you know, to make sure that you don't hoard the information that you have, but you open it up and give it to other people. Um, and that begets, you know, more innovation and creativity. So I imagine, you know, the more that we do that, I love the um, putting information in the commons. Uh, especially research where people can build on it, I think that's going to help carry us forward. So uh, I think that, um, you know, I think that's one of the ways that we can get information going. Mark? Being biased uh, as an artist and not wanting to say we have a monopoly on the genre that is founded upon the idea of imagination and creating ideas. I will say though, uh, that I think we need to shift this idea of where do new ideas come from as in terms of institutions and really seeing the most profound ideas on a future of education will come from those who are being excluded from education yes. currently. Because most people who are having the conversation on education, the current system is benefited to, to some degree. And so most of our mind frames are really looking at reforming schooling in a schooling structure, we're not talking about a transformation of education, which is a philosophical question, not just a structural question. And I think that has to be really put back out there to people who have felt that they've literally been kicked out and pushed out of places where they're supposed to be encouraged to grow and say, what type of model would you like to see? And not just in a rhetorical, so I can take it back to my institution, but then how do I get you the resources so you can grow your own model in your community and you are not dependent upon external structures and people who do not live in your community to come educate your community? You have a question? Yes. So this, just this morning there was an announcement uh, of a new educational collaboration called Coursera, mm -hmm. which is uh, designed to offer free online courses not for credit from four top tier schools, Stanford, Princeton, University of Michigan, and UPenn are all collaborating on this. They're pooling their resources together to offer free online courses. How do you all feel about this? And then also as an aside, what would you say to paying students at those universities that might have a problem with that? <laughs> so they're giving this stuff away for free now from amazing marquee universities. Why would anybody want to pay for this? So what do you guys think about that? Right, so you know, I, I look at that no different than in the gaming industry. So I can, I can pay for a game that might have taken $200 million to produce, or I can for free play Bejeweled, and then as I move through the process, there's something offered to me that I can go to another level and I can pay at this new level. I see the same thing happening in education, which is why I said earlier that some people need the organized campus setting, they need to pay to be in a resident hall, they need to pay to go to class in a structured way. But then there are people who are wanting to be exposed to that same brilliant professor, but they're not going to come here for four years. They don't need to come here for four years. They simply need the exposure to his brilliance for a moment and then they're going to go off and do something with that that will help our world. And I think there's value in both. So does that change the value that we've played? We've placed so much value on the educated professor with the PhD who does research and teaches. Does that diminish their value or change their role? Zorin, I mean, you've, even your role probably modifies given the platforms that you put out there. Um, yeah, like I said, I don't think uh, uh, if, if I just looked at myself and as an educator, I don't think I can make nearly as much difference, partly because probably I'm not as good of a teacher as some other people out there. But in terms of making hundreds of thousands of people being, being exposed to something and having the state of the art education on something that is not available then locally, uh, I can make drastically more difference. So that's actually how I look at my research. And, and so I'm actually looking for impact beyond the university rather than uh, specifically who I can affect. And Gene, I mean, you, char you do online, all online, but you do charge for it. When you see this uh, free model, I mean, you're competing with that as well. So how does that play into your calculation for what you do? Well, I really see that we are morphing into being in the credentialing business, not necessarily the font of all knowledge. 
And I, you know, I believe that a student can come to us having taken a course from MIT, Stanford, Harvard. In fact, we use curriculum from many of these institutions in, in our model. But what we do is we assess students and validate that they have the competence that they, competency that they need to get a degree. So I think that's a different mindset. Um, and if you look at what MITx is doing now, um, they've offered free courseware, but now they are offering a way that a student can get credit and it can be applied to some sort of credential. So I think the mind change here is that we're in the credentialing business. Did you want to say something to that, Mark? Yeah, I just wanted to encourage people as we even explore, uh, as an advocate of online education in all forms of education, because I don't think any one form has a monopoly on a solution, that we do have to address the digital divide. And we have to address that across the planet and even here within our own country. Not everybody has that access. So if education is a human right, then we need to start beginning to discuss that digital access is a human right also. Ruby, did you want to say something further to that or are you okay? Okay, all right, we have another question from our attendees. Good evening. Um, I've been very lucky to work with a lot of young people in the community. And my sense is that they could benefit and businesses could benefit from them getting more practical skills outside of the traditional classroom and perhaps outside of quote unquote internships. And I wanted to see if you had any advice or ideas for students and educators and businesses to be able to really harness the creative and dynamic energy of young people and provide them with more practical skills training. It's a good question because, I, I mean, on the, the, pa the piece of paper, the diploma used to assure you that job, but in many ways, employers are actually looking for what can you bring to the table. And, in, you know, when you have a young person who hasn't had that much time out of school to actually develop those skills, how do you actually, how does that person be of any use to any potential employer? So what do we do to encourage that kind of behavior? Gene? There are a number of wonderful programs like City Year um, that give our AmeriCorps um, that are dedicated to getting students to have um, mainly public service type uh, experience. And um, I do believe in internships and paid or otherwise. And I know most colleges and universities do offer those services to combine students with employers that are um, in the fields that the students want to go. I don't have any big idea for how to expand that network, but I think that there are plenty of untaken opportunities uh, that currently exist out there. A student needs to go in and be educated, I think, about what is available. Um, and I think there are resources at institutions to help them do that. Ruby. Yeah, so I would, I would add to that to say this is, this is where I think business and industry and the working world actually has to act, begin to play a role in education wherever it occurs so that we're not siloed in classrooms and that people actually have experiential learning because that is really when people are willing to step out and try what they've been exposed to. Um, and, and so that's got to occur really, you know, through K through 20 is how I like to describe it. And it values then out of school learning and it, in, and it begins to value informal educators. And so it's not, it's, it is what uh, she said as far as internships and, and mentoring, um, those kinds of experiences, but it actually is valuing what happens with that out of school provider and the informal educators that have actually all probably acted in our life, but they weren't credentialed, they weren't valued, and at, when I came to you as a potential employer, I didn't look for that on your resume. I didn't talk to you about that in your interview, and we need to lift that up in value. All right, well, in our closing seconds that we have, let's just, I want to ask you all to respond very briefly to this question. How optimistic are you for higher education as you see all this disruption and all this potential and all this competition happening right now? Jean? I'm very optimistic. Um, I agree with you that this is a time of immense opportunity. 
um, seeing where the need is and having the ability to act on it to create greater change, what more heady work could there be than to really form the human capital that we need to carry our society forward? So I think it's a hotbed of innovation. Right, Zora. Uh, yeah, I, I, don't think, uh, I don't think it's possible to be pessimistic about it, uh, specifically for the reason that uh, education touches every single living person in the universe, and as such, uh, it is such an important issue that anything that doesn't work will only not work for a short period of time, simply due to its importance. Ruby? Yeah, I agree. I mean, this is, I think, I'm so glad I'm here because the potential and the possibilities are endless. And, you know, I, my thing is, is I always like to do the analogy of rock candy. You stick a string in and, and that stuff just gravitates to make the candy and that's the stage that we're in right now. I'm the string. Mark, last word with the last few seconds we have. I think if you're willing to toss everything outside of your brain that you believe education is, then we have a blank canvas in front of us and a whole bunch of oils and Crayolas. All play. right, we'll leave it there. Gene Floten, Zoran Popovich, Ruby Love, and Mark Gonzalez, thanks for helping us hack EDU in this special episode of Four Peaks. And thanks to our live audience here at the University of Washington's Husky Fest. I invite you all to extend your reach and continue to submit your ideas on Twitter at hashtag HackingEDU. I'm Hanson Hossein.